just, you know, you are a much better man than I am. You see, had that been me and all that taking place and my wife was gone, it would have been a conversation like, the Lord is leading you back now. <laughs> I have you on the next flight. And so you're a good example, brother. You really are. All right. Uh, let's see here. Um, let's, I got many, I should have just picked one to springboard off of here today. Uh, let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, even though I will not really be getting to this verse until next week. I'll use it as a springboard to get into unconditional election. Three, four, and five of Ephesians chapter one. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we certainly do. Lord, we love you, and Lord, we ask for your help tonight. Lord, I pray that you would uh, give me clarity and, and help me to teach with clarity tonight. And uh, Lord, that we would have understanding of your word. Lord, you help us to be grounded and to be firm in our faith. Lord, uh, to use this to help us to understand why we believe what we believe, especially in this ever-confusing world. And so, Lord, as we look at this, please give the understanding that's needed. And, and still, even those here right now, even though we're looking at such a, a doctrine like this, there are those who no doubt have different me, needs and, and things going on in their life. And, Lord, I still pray that you would use this to speak to their heart, to strengthen them, and, and be a help where is needed. And if there's anyone here who has not been truly converted, Lord, we do pray for their salvation even this evening. Lord, I pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. We also need to be praying. I forgot to bring up in my greeting for Roger. Barbara had called. His feet or legs were swelling, so I called the doctor. And they said they didn't want him waiting until Monday. So he went to the ER right around 3 or 4 o'clock or so there. So I'm not sure what's going on yet with that. It was been too early before we started church to get anything back from the doctors. But do remember Roger in your prayers as he, he is at the ER right now with that. All right, so let's dive into this. We have covered an overview of Calvinism, looking at a little bit of who John Calvin was, how the doctrine came into existence, and, and uh, um, even the division it called in Europe and it caused in Europe and whatnot. We looked at the total depravity of man, uh, the last message, dealing with the T of the tulip. And the key from that was, is not that we have... It's not that there's not agreement that man is 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 depraved in his in his sinful wicked nature. It's the conclusion that we come to with that, and the conclusion of Calvinism is that inability. All right, and we looked at that in their writings how man is unable to turn to God, unable to seek God unless God first performs regeneration. So we looked at that, how they believe regeneration precedes faith, that you are born again well before so you can actually be saved. And, and the problems, we looked at that last time, that, that come with that, and why we never see one time in Scripture where regeneration precedes faith. It does not. Um, and that is, again, with the wrong definition, where they use the analogy. I was just reading today a, a debate that was taking place uh, between... Uh, I believe it was White and Hunt um, debating Calvinism, and, and White did use the analogy that I talked about last week of a dead man. And again, the problem is, is they use a carnal definition of dead, as if it means nothingness, and that's not what death means. You go to that actual person, the soul, that soul can respond certainly can. So anyhow, today though we, we come to the U of the tulip. And again, this is the very center and the heart of the doctrine of Calvinism. If you were to elevate one above the rest of this, this certainly would be the one. It is of, it is of utmost importance to the doctrine. It is the center of it. And um, so we are going to look at unconditional 
election. And I hope to provide a biblical basis to show you in the next couple of weeks why this portion of the doctrine is wrong and unscriptural. There's not one part of the tulip that I can see agrees with scripture. And so we're going to be dealing this evening with just three different parts as I lay a foundation on unconditional election. And then next week I will get into their proof text for it and, and begin to look at those uh, um, from, a, uh, from, a, from context, uh, from a, a, a textual basis. So first, um, of the three parts we're going to look at this evening, first we're going to look at what Calvinists believe about God's foreknowledge and his omniscience. Secondly, we're going to look at did God preordain everything, including sin? And thirdly, does man actually have a free will? So let me add this too. Um, this comes up oftentimes, and it can be, a, uh, it can be an issue. There are times when you're talking with those about Calvinism that they, will, that they rarely will give you audience because of the stature of men like Charles Spurgeon um, or men in our culture today that are very prominent Calvinist, men like John MacArthur. Um, and they, they look at them and at, at really how some of those men are incredibly brilliant, and both those two men would be. Um, and I certainly don't, don't come close to that level. So they look at that at that base and they say, well, then why would I listen to you? So we need to, we need to touch on that a little bit because that's a common argument. Even in one of the YouTube comments that were put there, they had said, the Calvinists, will, the, the YouTube comments will escalate rapidly when you deal with Calvinism. And so one of them had just commented, he didn't deal with any of the doctrine of total depravity. He just said, MacArthur or White would tear him up in a debate. He might be right. One, White debates for a living. He has thousands of times that he's debated. He might, but that doesn't mean I'm wrong. It doesn't. You say, well, then how can they be wrong when there they're, they're, they're are, I mean, let's face it, you get like men with MacArthur and his expository preaching has helped millions. Um, and I, I don't question that. I don't. Um, but let me put it this way. When you start with a wrong presupposition of something you believe, and then you go to the Bible, you are bound for trouble. All right? Because it's almost as if you're looking for that. Do I, do I believe that if, and obviously since I'm a non-Calvinist, I believe this completely, but I believe if you take a man like MacArthur, and all of a sudden he was a blank slate when it came to Calvinism, he just went to the Bible, there's no way I believe he'd come out the other end of Calvinist. I do not. Let me give you another example. Let's say that you have been taught your entire life that Jesus is not God. And then you happen to go and read in the Bible where him coming, when he was, uh, it was during his, the last week of his life when he traveled to Jerusalem. If you remember, he entered on there, he, he came in, uh, was it that Sunday? Monday when he was going back to start his debate and he comes up on the tree and it says supposing that there was to be fruit there. In your mind, because of the presupposition you'd have, you would conclude, I have a proof text that Jesus is not God. That's how you would see it, because of how you're viewing it with what you already think. That carries, that, don't misunderstand, that's true of all of us. There are certain presuppositions you have that when you come to the Bible, you've, you've got to be willing, and that's not easy to almost lay those aside. Let me give an example where it happened with me, which was, which wasn't easy because it was challenging that week when we were going through the book of Matthew and I came up on the teaching of Christ on, mar on, on uh, divorce and remarriage. And all of a sudden I'm diving into this and I'm getting challenged. I'm like, hmm. Where I could see an exception that I did not agree with before. And I had, I, that week I had to go over, okay, am I approaching this with any presuppositions? And I did have to admit it was something that was put in my mind before I ever researched it from Scripture. So then was I seeing things in Scripture based on the thought that was given? Um, and you want to go back and read those messages, you, you, you certainly can. There's a series when we went through Matthew on that. Um, so I think that has, that has some bearing in it. I, I don't think I am smarter or a, a better preacher than Charles Spurgeon. Not even close. 
That doesn't mean he wasn't wrong on this. So let's get into this email. The definition of unconditional election. Let's go to their document again. I'll go to the Canons of Dort. I covered that last week as to what this document is. To quote from there, the un- of the definition of unconditional election. The unchangeable purpose of God, whereby before the foundation of the world, he hath out of mere grace, according to the sovereign good pleasure of his own will, chosen from the whole human race a certain number of persons to redemption in Christ. Again, if anyone is to be saved, it is because God has chosen them to be saved simply out of his grace. There's key words associated with this doctrine that we're going to be getting into, words like election, predestination, sovereignty, reprobation, foreknowledge, decrees, counsel. The words election and predestination the, excuse me, the words election and predestination are the Bible u- words used to build this doctrine. We need to know what both those words mean. Election simply means to choose. Predestination means to determine beforehand. So in simple words, again, I believe Calvinists and non-Calvinists would agree with that definition at a simple level at a simple level, excuse me. Election means to choose. Predestination means to determine beforehand. That these words are in Scripture is not the debate. The debate is who is elected and what are they elected to? That's the debate. They make much, when you get into studying unconditional election, about the decrees of God what God has decreed before time, before the foundation of the world. Calvinists believe that in time past, God decreed all events, including who would obtain salvation and who would be reprobate so as to go to hell. Let me quote from some of their sources. Now understand, some of the things I'm going to deal with today are debate it within Calvinism themselves. Okay, Some Calvinists would refer to what I'm getting ready to dive into, that this group would be called hyper-Calvinist. All right? And the truth is, though, when you break it down, uh, it, I remember when I was studying it out, to me the hyper-Calvinists were just honest Calvinists. They just simply thought, if I believe this, then this does have to be true, and they were willing to admit it. All right. Where the other ones, when they saw how horrible that thought was, said, no, I can't go that far. All right. I can't, and you'll understand why as we go through this. So let me quote. Um, first off, we'll get into W.E. Best. He's a, he wrote many books on Calvinism. He, he died actually 20, 30 years ago. 1950s and 60s was his time of his influence, and he did debates and whatnot. But anyhow, let me, let me quote from him. The decrees of God may be regarded in one complex decree, including all things. The extent of God's decree covers everything before time, through time, and subsequent to time. It is unchangeable. There is no alteration in the divine intention. No new act will ever into, enter into the divine mind. Furthermore, there will be no uh, reversion of the divine plan. All right? So again, and we're going to see, I'll quote more, more from it, how he is laying the foundation that God has decreed everything. This is from the Westminster Confession. By the decree of God, for the manifestation of his own glory, some men and angels are predestinated unto everlasting life, and others foreordained to everlasting death. Calvinists believe that the predestination part of God's decree applies to salvation. In other words, God decreed all events, and when discussing the parts dealing with salvation, God predestinated. He predetermined, in their belief, who would go to heaven. They say it's out of his grace, out of his glory, 
that it wasn't because he liked some, disliked others, that in his grace he just chose, these will be the ones that I will regenerate, that will turn to me. Matter of fact, they have no choice but to be saved, by the way. That those are the ones, we'll get into that with irresistible grace, they have no choice, because God decreed it. And that the others are foreordained to spend an eternity in hell. And, and, and their response, we're going to see as we get more and more into the response, well, they deserve it anyhow. So God is right in doing so. Mm. They talk much of God's sovereignty. The basis behind unconditional election, they say, is God's sovereignty. And God certainly is in control. You know, if, if you have been here any amount of time, you know I am a strong proponent, a strong believer in the sovereignty of God in the events in this world. But they have almost what is considered to be, the terminology I mean, in the books, they call it an extreme view of God's sovereignty. I don't think it's an extreme view of God's sovereignty. It's simply a wrong view of God's sovereignty. And that wrong view of God's sovereignty is the foundation for the wrong assumptions leading to the doctrine of unconditional election. This view on God's sovereignty leads really to many false doctrines. We're going to see this. For instance, they believe the only reason God is all-knowing. Now, get this. This is just, I remember when I first read this years, I was just like, what? It's kind of like when you first find out that they actually believe regeneration precedes faith, that you're born again before salvation ever occurs. That's just, I remember when I first read that, it was just shocking. Like, how could you believe that? But the reason why they believe that God is omniscient, or, uh, um, yeah, omniscient is simply because he predetermined everything to happen. So the question comes, to what extent is God in control? Does man have free will? The Calvinist belief is that if God is sovereign, if God is in control, then man cannot have free will. It is a belief that God has ordained everything, and as we're going to see, including sin. And that's where it's debated. Some Calvinists would say, well, I don't believe that. But it's just the logical conclusion of where it comes to. And there are many Calvinists who do. I'm going, to quote, I'm going to quote to you from sources that hold to that view. This is from Clark. A quote from him. Every event is foreordained because God is omniscient. Of everything God says, thus it must be. Must not they who say that God does not foreordain evil acts now hang their heads in shame? Palmer says, God has foreordained, and at the conclusion of his long sentence, he says, even sin. So why does God know what is going to happen in the future? Again, according to Calvinists, it's because God has preordained all events, and that's why he knows what's going to happen. That's absurd. The irony here is, it, it, there's an irony with this doctrine. It, it's, it's really that they're almost making God's sovereignty small and not seeing how great God is and how great he is in his sovereignty and in his power. The reason why God knows the future is not because he preordained it, it's because he's God. He's not even in time. Let me give some quotes. The idea that God knows the future without having planned it, without controlling it, is totally foreign to Scripture. No, your thought is totally foreign to Scripture. If God did not foreordain all things, he could not know the future. God foreknows and knows all things because he decreed all things. Crazy. God knows what's going to happen in the future because he is God. He is all knowing. It doesn't say in the Bible, when it deals with God being omniscient, how everywhere it stresses over and over. First John, I mean, there's so many verses I have written down here that we can go to that are examples of God being all-knowing. That's why he knows everything, because he's all-knowing. It doesn't say because he decreed everything. It says he's all-knowing. I mean, it's, it's right there in Scripture. 
You're adding to it because you're starting with another document and trying to make it fit into Scripture. And again, one of the things I appreciate about MacArthur because he's huge on drawing out of Scripture, not with predetermined thoughts going to it. Yet that's what's happening here. You're starting with the thought and going to Scripture to try and back it up. And that becomes dangerous. But there are many verses. Uh, you can think in Acts chapter 1, who God knew the hearts of all men when they were trying to decide who to replace Judas with. God knew the hearts. He knew. He was all knowing. It wasn't a question that he decreed it. So with many of those within Calvinism, they believe that God has preordained everything, including sin. And I've quoted some already who hold to that view. And again, if you believe in this different extreme view of God's sovereignty, your obvious conclusion has to believe you believe God is the author of sin and preordained all sin. To, to, to deny, which a lot of Calvinists do, I mean, most of your mainstream ones would deny they believe that God's the author of sin. But but it's, again, it's just like happens all the time with him. It's talking out of two sides of your mouth. It's like me saying, I was born in Bree, Ohio, but I was not born in the United States. You can't have one without the other. Again, this belief stems from the idea that God knows everything because he preordained it. If you're going to hold to that, that leads to a lot of problems for you. If he knows everything because he preordained it, which is standard Calvinistic doctrine. So then, does God know what sin I'm going to commit tomorrow? He does. Then that means you believe he preordained it. Here's some more quotes. I think this is Palmer here. I didn't write it down. It is even biblical to say God has foreordained sin. If sin was outside the plan of God, then not a single important affair of life would be ruled by God, which that's an illogical conclusion, by the way. Again, this wrong view of God's sovereignty leading to this wrong doctrine. When you, have a, when you start with a wrong presupposition and you're building on that, ugh. Oh, Another quote, nothing comes to pass contrary to God's decree. Nothing happens by chance. Even moral evil, when he, abhor, when he abhors and forbids, occurs by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. All things, including the wicked actions of wicked men and devils, are brought to pass in accordance with God's eternal purpose. Calvin himself believed God ordained Adam to sin. Here's a quote from Calvin. I freely, I freely acknowledge my doctrine to be this, that Adam fell not only by the permission of God, but by his very secret counsel and decree. So let's take this to an obvious conclusion. I want you to think about this. Get this. Let's just not use the word sin, because we're so used to it. It's so commonplace. This would mean that those vile, wicked, horrible acts that men commit would be preordained by God. Think of some of the atrocities, the horrors, the vileness, the wickedness. To conclude, God preordained that act. That's absurd. I mean, you could just 
think from the wickedness of men and things that occur. The vileness, the perversions, that God preordained that. God's holy nature makes that impossible and absurd. So let's look at a, a verse they like to use. Let's turn over to Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah 45 and verse 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. They like to use this as a proof text. See that? Right there. Do not make the error of equating evil with sin. There are times it can be hard to distinguish, but context bears it out. When man does evil, it's going to be sinful. When God does, it never is, and it'll be clear. Evil and goodness are ethical in nature, all right? Temporal in a consequence. Whereas when you deal with sin and righteousness, that's different. Those are moral in nature and eternal in consequence. Let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 17. Verse 14, and Absalom and all the men of Israel said, the counsel of Hushai, the archite, is better than the counsel of Ahithophel, for the Lord hath appointed to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel and to the intent that the Lord might bring evil upon Absalom. Notice how the word evil is used here, not in a sinful sense, but in a judgment sense, all right? You see it used the same way in Nehemiah chapter 13. We're not going to turn there for time's sake. Ne Nehemiah 13, 18. God will bring evil again in a judgment sin. It doesn't mean God's committing sin or even decreeing any sin to occur at all. But bad things are getting ready to happen. Amen. Suffering's getting ready to occur. So when something bad happens, that, you can use that word there in that place. That's evil that happened. It doesn't make it sinful. There are times when man and, the sin, and evil with sinfulness go hand in hand, but not with God. It's used in the sense where God, that bad things happen. Job. Matter of fact, Job 34, actually. Let me see if I can find it. There was all types of evil that happened unto Job. Job 34, verse 10. And therefore, hearken unto me, ye men of understanding. Far be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should commit iniquity. God never gets, commits sin. But the word evil is also used in the essence of bad things, of using it in forms of judgment, like we saw in 2 Samuel, like we see in Nehemiah, and other places in Scripture. We're referring to bad things getting ready to occur. For instance, in, in PNG, we had, we had these rain trees, and I loved them. They were huge. It's still my favorite. They're just incredible, these giant, giant trees. And we had a main one on our road there in Edmonton, and it, it collapsed. It, I guess just old. I don't know why. I don't remember any event that happened. Nobody saw it coming. 
but it fell, and a police car was right there with the policeman inside. We only have a couple of police guys right now in Matanai. It killed them. And that was looked on as an evil event. That terminology isn't wrong. It was a really bad thing that happened. Since Calvinists believe that God has preordained everything, this leads to the conclusion in, in their mind that man doesn't have a free will. But we do. Calvinists teach that if man has a choice, then God is not sovereign. As if somehow God giving man a choice attacks God's sovereignty. No, it's in God's sovereignty that he chose to give man choice. It speaks to the greatness. It doesn't limit God one bit. God in his sovereignty, when he decided, get this, to create man in his image. A God who has choice gave the creation he created in his image choice. It was in God's sovereignty that he decided to give man free will. The Bible is clear. Man does have free will. We can see it from Genesis chapter 3 on the free will of man. Where Paul speaking in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, how, he, he, let me go there. He's talking about in preaching the gospel in context, if I remember right, willingly doing this, of his will doing this. Not of some secret decree determined ahead of time that this is my choice. Verse 16, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, for woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For, th for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward, but if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. He had a choice of his own will. It's, it's like they, Calvinists want to teach, well, well it, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm using my word here, not theirs. It's almost like they think that man is that God puts a delusion upon man to let him think he has free will when he doesn't. No, we were created in His image. We have free will. They say, "Well, then, 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 uh, you know, what? A, let, let's take for example Judas. That, that in their mind, that had to be predetermined, preordained by God. We have the prophecies. God knew what was going to happen. No, know what God knew in His sovereignty. He knew there was a man who, in His own free will, would make those choices. And that sovereign God, whose sovereignty is greater than you can even imagine, in His sovereignty, put Him in the right place at the right time with a man with His own free will would make those choices to fulfill prophecy, without Him having to remove that man's free will. Make no mistake, God does know everything. He knows exactly how you will decide what you'll decide. He already knows it. And, and to think of how powerful it is that he puts everything together. God, in his, his mind-boggling sovereignty, that's why you're alive right now. Because he knew the choices you would make. And we see throughout the word of God, that man can go against God's counsel. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 25. But ye have set at naught all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. Verse 30. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Man had free will to go against the very word they use, God's counsels. Man has free will. That doesn't change the sovereignty of God. At all. It was in his sovereignty. He made that decision. And he knows, just like, let's face it, it wouldn't be too difficult to put a Judas in the right place, would it? To find a man that's full of greed, more worried about power and position than he is about glorifying God. Boy, that'd be complicated to find somebody like that. He simply had the right person in the right time. 
That's where sovereignty comes into play. Judas had free choice in his own will to do what he did. It wasn't some predeterminate counsel. What God knew based on his foreknowledge, what that man would decide to do. Think, according to Calvinism, that could have easily just have been Peter as it could have been Judas. No. God knew based on the free, which is what God wants. He, he created us not to be robots. He created a, a creature in his image that would choose to love him. God knew Adam would sin. No question about it. He knew it. But he didn't preordain it. He knew that if I create man with free choice, sin would happen. God also knew, but here's what I could do. Getting into salvation, getting into what he did. And when we see now how much more we have through the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ than even Adam had. Throughout scripture, man has free will. There's other verses. I just gave the two in Proverbs. We can see different places, examples over and over of man's free will. When God desired this, but man said no. Let me think of one more. I, I, this, this one isn't here. I'll, I'll close with this. If this ain't the right verse, I'm not. we're close anyhow. Yeah, I think this is it. Yes. This is dealing with John the Baptist in context um, here in Luke uh, chapter 7. Verse 28, we have that popular verse. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers... What does the Bible say here? Rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. They made the choice. And just like those that chose to follow and believe and get baptized, they then also made the same choice. You have a free will. You have a free will. And we're going to see as we get into this next week, we'll dive into it more. We'll start to get it more into their actual proof text like I read from Ephesians chapter 1 and, and, and looking at that. And you can probably already see, if you really look at the verses I read in context, you actually see what has been elected, what was preordained. The answers are right there in the verses. They're right there. But we'll dive into that um, next week. So with heads bowed and eyes closed. Perhaps you have a need here to come and pray about this evening. We certainly want to give you still time to be able to do that. And if there's anyone here, say, Pastor, please pray for me. Um, I have never been converted to Christ, and I, and I need you to pray for me. I'm not certain that I am saved. If that is you, would you just raise your hand where I could see it? All right, if you need to come and pray, you can pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you would bless this invitation, work in hearts and lives, Lord, I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Let's turn to page 483. And if you need to pray, you come and pray. Mm -hmm.